Hey, welcome to Dan's Model Works. And it's another new project day. This project is going to involve a little bit of a convergence of several things in my life. The first is going to be a little bit from um, another part of my hobby modeling career in the past. Um, part of it's going to be a job I had for a couple of years. And of course, things I want to build right now. So this is a Canadian quarter, 25 cent piece. You can see we got a caribou on there. And this is an EMD, Electromotive Division, SD40, which is a railway locomotive. And this is in N scale, otherwise, uh, best represented as 1 to 160 scale. This is not the smallest model railroad scale. Um, I believe that is Z scale or Z scale, which is something like 1 200 or maybe 220. I'll have to look it up. I'll put it up on the screen. Anyway, I used to do my model railroading when I was heavily involved with it in N scale, 1 160 scale. And one of the things that bothered me was a lack of contemporary vehicles. Now, I was heavily involved in model railroading in the mid to late 1990s. And there just was very, very few cars available like automobiles and trucks and things like that. So a lot of them I had to kitbash myself. This guy right here. The cab is a Ford Louisville. And I was really excited when the company that made the cab portion came out with it. And it was actually made by uh, William K. Wathers, which I believe is still in business. They're a major supplier of model railroad products. And basically what this was, was it was a utility truck and it was based on uh, a Ford Louisville and uh, you got uh, a package had two in there and of course I immediately chopped off the utility body and in this case I put a pickup and delivery body for CP Express and Transport on it and I was so excited when they released this and I actually built quite a number of models using the Ford Louisville that they came up with. And I suppose we'll bring in the second part of the, the confluence is why did I go with CP Express and Transport in the early 1990s when I lived in Ottawa, Ontario, the nation's capital. I was a security guard for two years and about a year and a half of that time uh, we had a contract with Canadian Pacific Express and Transport to basically guard their truck terminal in Ottawa. So three shifts a week, every weekend, I would be sitting in my car <laughs> looking at a whole fleet of these. The only thing was is most of the, their day cabs were uh, International S-Series, but they did have some Louisvilles for over-the-road work. So I didn't just do a, a delivery truck. I also kitbashed it into a tractor. Now, yes, the kingpin is really enormous for the fifth wheel. And that's mostly because uh, most of the N-scale uh, trailer kits or, or models had a really big fat kingpin so that's how big I made it so it could hold them but basically the cab itself was the product that came from Walther's and the wheels I think I turned them on a dremel using nails the roof air deflector was scratch built the smokestack was scratch built everything except for the actual cab body itself was scratch built so CP Express and Transport operated a huge fleet of pups. So the basic trailer here was made by Atlas, 
which is a model railroading company. It did have tandem axles on it. I reduced those to singles. So, and then I had to construct this, which is sometimes known as a converter or a dolly or a bike. And I'm sure there's about a hundred other names. Here's the other trailer. There we go. So since I spent many hours staring at these things a few years prior when I was a security guard, I suppose it was only natural that I kind of wanted to make models of them for my model railroad scenes. I did add details to the trailers. I put, uh, and maybe a lot of this has probably been knocked off. Um, you can see that there's a, a propane bottle on the underside because these were heated trailers. Um, this one still has the crank on it. You can see the crank is for the landing gear. Now, one thing that's incorrect is this says a wheeled landing gear. Oops, I just got an email. What I would like to do, uh, 25 years after I constructed these, is I would like to build a CP Express A-Train in 125th scale. And that's possible because AMT has re-released their Ford Louisville snowplow slash dump truck slash tractor, which gives me a truck to use. And as well, they've released their double header set, which is basically two 28 foot pups. Now, this wasn't the absolute best uh, tractor that was released. Atlas ended up a few years after I made this, releasing this guy, which was worlds ahead in terms of uh, scale detail. And then another company called GHQ also brought out the Ford Louisville, which I suppose is a good illustration of how ubiquitous the Ford Louisville was in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So the first of the ingredients for this project is going to be this kit by AMT, which of course is their snowplow kit, the Ford LNT 8000, and the T means it's a tandem axle. 8000 means it's not the, the absolute largest size that they made. There was a, a slightly larger heavy duty version. Um, I believe the engine that comes in this is the Caterpillar V8 diesel. The dump bed, probably going to use that for another project. The plow, yep, yep, I'm saving that too. So if anyone's planning on saying, oh, can you ship it off to me? Yeah, I've got plans for this stuff. It may be forever before I get to it, but so this is ingredient number one, and of course this is ingredient number two. This is a heavy box. And this is the AMT's double header. Now this is two 27 footers, close enough to 28 feet. And this is basically what's known as an A train, as opposed to a B train. An A train, the best way to describe it is three main pieces. You have your first trailer, you have a second piece known as, sometimes it's called a converter, sometimes it's a dolly, sometimes, there, there must be dozens of different names for this particular piece, but it is separate. It is completely detachable and it can go somewhere else and live on its own, have its own life. Then the second trailer hooks onto it. These things are murder if you will need to back it up because what ends up happening is is your converter here, your extra little set of wheels inevitably starts going one way or the other and the whole thing starts jackknifing. A newer concept and really not that new because CP Express and Transport, which was hardly a revolutionary company, had a number of these in the 90s, the early 90s, was a B train. A B train, the first trailer has a double set, like a dual tandem set of wheels. 
And when they want to pull another trailer, the whole assembly actually slid back. So it was still attached to the front trailer, but buried inside was another fifth wheel. So as it slid out, that fifth wheel was exposed. The second trailer could lock onto it, and it was made for a much more stable you know, configuration. And I believe Tim Hortons, all of their 28-foot trailers are set up this way. But it's by no means the only way to do it. But we're going to go with the traditional A-Train. And this kit comes with a, a separate dolly to go between the two of them. And I'm also going to point out that I'm not going to build these identically. I'm probably going to leave one of them as an exterior post van. The other one I'm probably going to give new sides to and make it a smooth side trailer. Just to keep things interesting. So, I've got a couple pictures here on my computer. And the one on the left here is a close-up profile shot of my Coke truck. And the one on the left, we'll talk more, we'll come back to this picture a few more times during this project. This is off of Pinterest, and I've done an image search online, and every time this picture shows up, it's attributed to a user on Pinterest uh, named Mike. I got permission from him to use the picture. And this is a CP Express and Transport Louisville. And we can see some differences here. And the biggest in terms of the body is the hood length. You can see this has a shorter hood length. There was a number of different hood lengths for Louisville's. Um, this is what was on most of them. And this was the long version. Now, there were two other versions. There was the one that was used on the LTL 9000. And that was the, the big owner-operator front end that was really long that uh, was on my record truck. And then there was another one that has an axle back configuration. So it was also a long hood. But the front axle was located here in terms of the cab. So there's kind of a, a weird arrangement where it looks like it's super aerodynamic. But anyway, this is what we're worried about here. And the easiest way to tell them apart is you can see the back third of the fender is attached to the firewall. When this flips forward, it stays behind. On this one, you can see that the entire fender is connected to the hood. So when it flips up, the whole thing flips up. So what we have to do is we have to amputate on our AMT kit. We have to take the fender off of the cowl and we need to glue it onto the hood. And then we need to extend the hood. And then we'll have to do a little bit of filler work right here. Now there's some other things that, that we also have to change as well. The fuel tanks, that'll be in a future episode. But these trucks that CPET had, CP Express, they had spoked wheels. The kit comes with uh, discs, so we're going to be uh, having to mold some spoked wheels for our kit. So how am I planning on achieving this? At one point, I was thinking of going back maybe uh, an eighth of an inch from here and cutting a straight line and sectioning it basically putting in some styrene to stretch it. However, if you look at it, I mean, this is at an angle right up till it gets to about the cowl. So I think what I'm actually going to end up doing is cutting two pieces that are the, the, the stretch I want. I'll put them on the side here. And then using the curve as a template, I'll cut another curved piece to go in here. It'll be the same distance, but of course it'll be a curve. And then that way everything will still fit when we put it up against the cowl and we won't have to worry about the angle. The other thing that's going to happen is we will amputate the fenders. And of course we'll have to heal that up and, and, and make it a, a solid panel but we'll have to take these fenders 
and transplant them to our extended hood. And that should give us our, our longer nose version. And it looks from the pictures that the extension is probably a little bit more than the distance of this thickness here, the firewall. Because that is maybe about half the distance of the fender. Whereas the fender needs to actually move forward maybe about three quarters of its length. Well, for better or worse, I've chopped off the stub bits of the fenders from the body. And they're, of course, going to be grafted onto our fenders or our front end and hopefully blend it in so that it looks nice and smooth. So the next stage for the body is going to be to fill in this area right here. Well, this is not perfect, but that's what putty's for. Our process of extending our hood continues. You can see I now have the sides on and the top and the profile fit seems to be pretty good. A little bit of tweaking still to do, but you know, if I go for a side view, you can see that everything is close. I do want to tweak these in slightly. And of course, I need to fill in this top corner. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to put a very heavy solid block of plastic in here that's going to be the right length going to glue that in and then I'm basically going to sand to the profile and hopefully that will lock everything together nicely. I've let this dry overnight. Hopefully my seams will hold together while I do some sanding. We basically want to get rid of all the superfluous plastic before we start doing any filling. All right that's our first crude sanding to knock down the, the corners of things. If I put it up against the cab, let's see, you can see it's not perfect. I'm going to have to tweak things a little bit, but let's be honest, the fit on the average truck is not wonderful anyway, but let's break out the putty and start filling in some of the cracks. There's a crack there. There's a line there. This line here, of course, needs to be taken care of. Same thing right there. So what you're looking at now is there's been a second application of putty, and I've sanded that down. I've also, there's, there's a little bit of a character line that comes along here. I've extended that with a file over to here. Curiously, there's nothing on the other side. I just filed just a a hair of one right here. Um, I'm, I'm not putting this piece on yet until I know this is all good just because I don't want the, uh, the air intake to kind of get in my way. Uh, the piece of tape is basically on here to protect the vestigial logo that they cast in here on the side. I have not yet looked at the decal sheet. I don't know if AMT gives that to us. I really wish they would just because to try to dry brush this is really hard. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take some neutral gray and I'm going to brush paint it on and that'll show us if there's any really horrible things we have to fix on here. I've given our hood a shot of primer so we can see how we did. And I think, I, I think I'm going to put it in the success category. And just going to Put it up against the, the cab. I think that looks pretty good. Now there is a bit of a bevel that needs to be cut on the front of the, the cowling piece. But I need to confirm that from the photos. But I'm about to put this in the success category. Now as for the grill, 
I, I masked this off because I'm hoping possibly to put the deluxe grill on this, which is where the, the there was basically a chrome ring all the way around the outside. So I'm going to have to scratch build the actual um, honeycomb that goes in here. Not really honeycomb, grill. Grid, that's what we're looking for. Um, so I haven't completely decided on how to do that. So I don't want a bunch of primer getting in my way. So, but if I take the hood off of our short one, you can see the difference between them. And I, th I think it's pretty acceptable. So off camera, I've been doing a bunch of mold making. And this is the mold for our front wheels. This is the mold for our uh, rear inners. So there's one of our fronts. And the little bit of green there, that's some Play-Doh that I had stuffed into the originals. So one problem with my, my wheel making um, procedures and I've addressed this before is there's not much detail on the back here but I'd rather have some plain backs than nothing at all so these one as I said before are, are the uh, inner rears and I don't have any of my outer rears done mostly because I made a mold and uh, I, tr I, I basically did one casting out of it and I hated it. So I'm trying it in a two-part process where this will be the tire and the rim and this, this will be the, the spider, kind of the, the spoked part on the inside. So, but what's happened is, is um, I'm just down to the last bits of my supply of resin. And if you look at the back side of this part, you can see how porous it is. And that's usually an indication that your resin is starting to go off. I only have probably about 15% of the bottles left. It's probably just enough to, to, not that one, here, to cast these, maybe four of them. But I don't think the quality is going to be particularly high. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, buy some more resin and I think this will do it for this particular part of the project. No, it doesn't seem like I got much done, but there was quite a bit of time spent on our introduction. So I hope this project is going to interest a lot of people. Um, thanks for watching. Until next time, just keep on modeling.